What's happening, y'all? Welcome inside the Fantasy Stock Exchange. Danny Bush and PFF's Trevor Sikama coming at you today with a bit of a fun video. Basically, what we're going to be doing today is picking the ideal landing spot for all of the best wide receiver prospects in the 2022 NFL Draft. Me and Danny probably focusing more so on like a fantasy perspective. Trevor being, you know, an NFL Draft Scout, he's going to give us a little bit more insight that we usually can't provide. So uh, if you guys enjoy this video at any point, as always, like, comment, subscribe. Trevor, I'll let you introduce yourself. If they don't know who you are, they can find you on uh, Twitter at Tampa Bay Trey, but I'll let you, uh, you know, take your intro here. This is this is very true at Tampa Bay Trey. Well, first of all, it's awesome to be with you guys. Danny reached out to me, told me the the fantasy stock exchange name and the NFL stock exchange name with my podcast. I mean, it was just a perfect marriage. Just collab had to happen, you know, so very excited to be here. Very excited for this format. This is going to be a lot of fun. Love ranking wide receivers and giving them their perfect spots. I think this is a great way to explain skill sets of wide receivers in the form of teams that you could see them really succeeding. So I love this idea. Can't wait to dig in. At Tampa Bay Trey on Twitter, all the work over at Pro Football Focus, and then, of course, uh, at the NFL Stock Exchange podcast as well. All in the description, baby. Let's go. Yeah, so we're going to hit the intro, and then we're going to get right into this. Okay, so briefly what we're doing, there is some rules to this because I think it's pretty clear to everybody that there's two premier landing spots for wide receiver prospects in this draft, the Kansas City Chiefs, Patrick Mahomes, and the Green Bay <laughs> Packers with Aaron Rodgers. We can't put every player to this, these two teams. And also, we're going to keep in mind whereabouts these players are going to go in the draft. So ideally, we'd love to see Garrett Wilson go to the Green Bay Packers, but I don't think there's a chance in hell he's going to last at 22, and I don't know if they're going to trade up for him. So basically what we're going to be doing <laughs> is matchmaking these guys. You can only use the team and the prospect one time. So if you put, you know, uh, Garrett Wilson to the New York Jets, you cannot use Garrett Wilson or the New York Jets again. So unless, I mean, I'm sure they could draft a second wide receiver, but we're going to focus on the top guys anyway. I was going to so, say, what if they got two first round picks? They, I mean, they what could. They they could. Picks? Uh, Green Bay could go with two wide receivers. I don't think they will for the purposes of this exercise. We're going to assume that they're going to do only one wide receiver. So let's start. With wide receiver one season himself, he is my wide receiver one. He is not Danny's wide receiver one. He's my one. two. Relax. He's, He's my two. Trevor's wide receiver one, I believe. We're going to start with, uh, you know, the two-sport <laughs> athlete, Drizzy Drake London himself, wide receiver from USC. Um, I'm going to go first and basically say that I, nobody's going to like this landing spot. For the first thing that I say, the reason I love this landing spot is because this is for fantasy purposes, and this is where I think he can earn the most targets. The Houston Texans at pick 13 is actually where I have Drake London going. I know it's not, you know, going to an elite quarterback with, you know, elite offenses and stuff like that. But the Houston Texans and Drake London is a good marriage to me because of the wide receivers in this draft class. I think Drake London proved that he can dominate the an offense's targets and, and market share the most out of any wide receiver in this class. So I like Drake London going to the Houston Texans with Davis Mills. Long term future, obviously, hopefully things get better in Houston. But for the time being, he's going to be a target hog in Houston. Trevor, I'll throw it to you. Where do you got Drake London going? So I have Drake London going to the Jets. I feel like that's a great spot for him. And I'm not just saying that because it's realistic because we see that in mock drafts all the time. I genuinely think this is a really good spot. Like I, I have Drake London as my wide receiver one, but if I thought there was a better fit, because it's not like I have him wide receiver one by a country mile or anything. If I thought there was a better fit for the New York Jets, number 10, I'd mock that receiver to the Jets. But I genuinely think that Drake London is the best prospect for Zach Wilson in that room because you've got Corey Davis, but he's been a little bit of a disappointment. You have Braxton Barrios, you have, uh, you have Elijah Moore, but you don't have that guy that Zach Wilson can just throw it up to and, and, and magic can happen. And I think that that's really what was missing. You know, you looked at him last year and I think he tried to be, it was this mayor. It was this well, I say marriage, but it, it didn't go well because he was trying to partially be that BYU gunslinger out of the pocket backyard football kind of quarterback. And yet he was also at times, it felt like trying to be robotic and trying to take that next step and be that quote unquote, like, pro quarterback that everybody thought he was supposed to be. So on the throws that he would take chances to some of his wide receivers, those weren't the kind of wide receivers that you throw those 50, 50 balls up to that. You take those chances that needs to still exist in Zach Wilson's game. That's how he becomes the best version of himself in the NFL as he could be. And the way you do that is you throw it up to Drake London. I genuinely believe that having a player like that increases the confidence of 
not just not just Zach Wilson, but the offensive line, the running backs, the rest of the receivers, the whole offense overall, when it is third and five and you need something to convert this, and Zach Wilson hikes the ball, left tackle gets worked by an inside move. <laughs> he's got a flush to his right. He's got he's like, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, okay, I'm just throwing it. And he just throws to Drake London, and that dude comes down with it because that's his bread and butter. It does so much for you. So I, I genuinely think that Drake London's best spot is with the gunslinger, a fearless dude like Zach Wilson. And so I'm going to go with the New York Jets. Yeah, I mean, you made a very good case for this fit. It's the same fit that I have here. I mean, we at this that the fancy stock exchange over here are absolutely bullish on what the Jets have kind of built, you know, from a ground up franchise type of move. You know, you hire Sal, you have her that hire have that infrastructure of a lot of just trust that we have in this team. We like Zach Wilson last year. We're big, big Elijah Moore stance, but I do think that Drake London is this perfect, you know big bodied X style type of wide receiver that Zach Wilson in this offense really need. And if you're talking about from pure production, from a pure fantasy uh, standpoint, I mean, you're getting arguably the best receiver class. I know you guys have my one. Uh, he's my two right now. So I'm still very, very high on him in my own regard, but this is a legit guy who can step in and be that 130 plus target type of hog. And I mean, if we're translating that to fantasy, we're both bullish on, on Zach Wilson. We think that he can take that next step if he gets that type of weapon to pair with Elijah Moore. And if you're getting 130 targets from what we believe Zach Wilson in this offense can be, like we could be talking about a top 20 wide receiver even as soon as his rookie year. Right. And back to your point about what Zach Wilson needs in his offense. He he talked about it. I think it was in like training camp or the preseason that he needs to learn what throws he can and can't get away with. And I, I'll tell you, it's very forgiving when you got a guy like Drake London on the right. outside and Elijah Moore being as open as often as he's going to be open as well. So uh, let's move off of Drake London, unless anybody has any other thoughts real quick. I didn't, I don't think I mentioned this in the intro, but we don't actually know who each other picked. So we're going to have some guys where like, yep, that's, we all have, all three of us have that fit or some guys that we differ on. So the next guy that we're going to go on is uh, Garrett Wilson. Garrett Wilson currently going off the board, uh, you know, about the mid first round, according to grinding the mocks. I didn't actually mention it for Drake London. He's going early in the first round. Like we talked about Garrett Wilson. I actually have to the New York jets. And the reason I have Garrett Wilson there and not Drake London there is because I think he fits the scheme a little bit better in terms of like the 49ers, uh, type of uh, thing that they're running with Matt LaFleur. I think it makes him and Elijah Moore interchangeable. You can use them in any alignment. And I do think, I know like Elijah Moore has the stigma that he's not, you know, a number one wide receiver in the NFL or whatever. I do think he's a capable number one in the NFL. And having Garrett Wilson as the guy that he's paired with kind of really goes into that like interchangeability and and keeping the defenses guessing. I think with London, you you pigeonhole yourself into having him as the X, Elijah Moore as the, uh, you know, the Z receiver off the line of scrimmage or whatever. So I like having Garrett Wilson in the New York Jets scheme because that, that, that keeps that flexibility up. So uh, Trevor, what do you think of that fit? And where do you got um, Garrett Wilson going? No, it makes sense. I mean, my co-host at NFL Stock Exchange, Connor Rogers, he's big into covering the Jets and and he's a New York guy. And he talks about Garrett Wilson going to the Jets all the time. It's a really good, uh, a really good addition there. And I agree with it. I like Drake London better, but like I said, it's not like I have Drake London wide receiver one by a far margin, getting Garrett Wilson in there. I think anything really would help Zach Wilson at this point. They just got to get better at receiver for Garrett Wilson. I have the Atlanta Falcons. I think the Atlanta Falcons is a good spot for him because he has the all around ability to be an absolute target machine. And they're going to need a target machine for as much as you might like Kyle Pitts. And I love Kyle Pitts. That's only one receiver. Cordero Patterson can be a lot of different things for you, but you also need a surefire guy that you could play at X, you could play at Y, you could play at Z, and Garrett Wilson can play all of those things. He plays bigger than his size, but he's also got that quick yards after the catch, kind of quick hit style that he can tap into at any point in time. So for a team that lost Calvin Ridley, that lost Russell Gage, that has almost no other receiver <laughs> options, I feel as though... You know, Danny mentioned a, tar a potential target load for Drake London. If Garrett Wilson goes to the Atlanta Falcons, he will have the flexibility to play any alignment as an X, as a, as a Y, as a Z, whatever it is. And they're going to move him around everywhere. They'll get creative with him and they'll like, lean on him very heavy. So I know it's not a, a, the, the greatest quarterback situation in there, but I'm really excited to see what Mar Marcus Mariota is going to be able to do. And Garrett Wilson would immediately be his wide receiver one there in Atlanta.
I mean, from a dynasty from a dynasty perspective, you're getting the wide receiver one for you know CJ Stroud, Bryce Young, maybe next year. Who knows? We'll see. Because I mean, at the end of the day, I still think Atlanta is probably going to be a dumpster fire, regardless of what happens this year. And it kind of ties into my fit too. I also have Garrett Wilson to the Falcons, projected eighth overall pick. And I mean, it's pretty simple to me. You're getting that quasi, you know, Deontay Johnson, Calvin Ridley level separator into this offense. That, quite frankly, the wide receiver core. I mean. Kyle Pitts aside, we know he's a freak. We know how Gator good he is. Great. This, Gator great indeed. This, Gator great indeed. Thank you. I mean, this wide, this current wide receiver core consists of Olamid Zacchaeus, Demir Bird, and Kadero Hodge. I don't care who you have back out, uh, out there or who you really have as your quarterback going into the year, whether it's Mariota, whether you, you know, fucking throw Felipe Frank. I don't give a hell who's at quarterback. It's means to get them killed if that's your wide receiver trio going to the air, even if you have Kyle Pitts. Getting Garrett Wilson in the fold here, a you know, smooth, polished separator that can just really command targets, as you said. I mean, would it at all shock anybody if, again, I mentioned 130 plus targets for Drake London? Like, that'd be the bare minimum expectation for if Garrett right. Wilson ended up in this core. Like, it's genuinely that depleted of talent. You put him in that situation, top 10 draft capital. And from a pure fantasy standpoint, I mean, you're getting top 10 draft capital insulation on the Falcons with a ton of available available volume there. Like, it's a no-brainer to me. I absolutely love Garrett Wilson. I love that fit. And we're two for two right now, kind of being in sync, you know? There we go. This <laughs> this one, somebody's going to be in sync on this one, I think. So uh, the next guy that we're going to talk about is another wide receiver who probably, I think, in the NFL's eyes, would have been the wide receiver one off the board if he had not torn his ACL in the national championship game. Jamison Williams, I, I somebody's going to have the same fit that I have. I, there's no chance that nobody doesn't have the Kansas City Chiefs as the best fit for, for Jamison Williams. I know it's low-hanging for he's the fastest receiver in the draft. Let's get him to replace Tyreek Hill. But I genuinely think that Kansas City could use their draft capital to move up for Jamison Williams. Or I, I don't think he's going to fall to 29 or 30 where they're picking in the first round. I think they're going to make a move up. And I believe Charles Davis from NFL.com actually had them moving up to 17 with the Chargers to go and get Jamison Williams. I think, I mean, the fit's pretty obvious. He replaces Tyreek Hill. He's the fastest receiver in the draft. You got to give him some time probably to re uh, recoup and recover from the ACL tear, but he's going about the mid first round 18.5 per grinding the mocks in terms of his ADP right now. So like Jamison Williams, it ain't happening. I'm just letting <laughs> you know. Um, I have the other cheat code team. I have, I have him going to the Green Bay Packers and I, you know, I was on locked on Packers with Peter Bukowski earlier this week and we were actually chatting about this and he's like hey what's your of all of the i think you named five or six wide receivers that could potentially be the packers first round selection at number 22 who do you think is the best fit and i said well the guy that i want to see there the most is jameson williams because aaron Rodgers, i mean he he's not he's not the greatest of all time because that's tom brady and it's irrefutable but <laughs> aaron Rodgers might be the best passer Talent. you've ever seen right i mean like a top three at the very i mean like the dude is just so special and he is clearly still playing at an mvp level with back-to-back -back mvps and so to get somebody who has that type of speed and that type of athleticism athletic weapon that jameson williams does to give that kind of player to aaron Rodgers just feels like a cheat code man there are so many targets to be had with Devonte uh, adams no longer on that team you put jameson williams there and like it's basically going to be a repeat of the stats he had at alabama which are crazy you know we're talking double digit touchdowns over a thousand yards if he's fully healthy like if he's playing a full season with aaron Rodgers, man i don't care that he's a rookie he'd he'd, he'd get over a thousand yards and he'd be a monster for him so uh i really do think that not just year one, but year two, year three, that rookie contract with Jameson Williams would be special with Aaron Rodgers. And so that's where I've got him going. Yeah. I mean, we're all going to continue this trend of uh, getting this elite three level threat with an elite level passer. I mean, I have him going here to the Los Angeles Chargers. You mentioned the Chiefs nice. trading up with the Chargers to come get Jameson Williams. Well, why wouldn't they just sit and pick and take Jameson Williams? I mean, if we're talking about an elite pairing of elite skill sets, let's just talk about. Jamison Williams, third level ability, and Justin Her Justin Herbert's just raw arm talent. And that's the type of blend. That's the type of mixture you're getting here. You're getting the right howitz of an arm from Justin Herbert to pair with Jamison Williams and that elite deep speed. I mean, we're talking a mid 4-2 guy easily if he runs at the combine. Obviously, with the ACL, he wasn't able to. But putting Jamison's three-level threat ability next to known playmakers like Keenan Allen, Austin Eckler, and Mike Williams, I mean, this offense... Like Justin Herbert has a claim to be 
the quarterback one, quarterback two in dynasty if they got a guy like Jameson Williams to really pair with what they already have going on there, which is already a fringe top five offense. Getting Jameson Williams in the fold, like you're taking a team that's already the top of the AFC to potentially getting that number one, number two, number three type of seed, which ultimately is going to be on the back of this offense carrying the low because that – like who's stopping that offense? I know we yeah, like making that's that the joke, Cincinnati Bengals approach, right? I, I do think you know NFL is a copycat league and all that kind of stuff. So will teams make that like we're not going to go with the defensive tackle that you want to give us at seventeen? We're going to go with more firepower on offense, and we're going to give Justin Herbert a uh, you know a locked and loaded three level threat like Jamison Williams. I think. I mean, I hope Jamison Williams is listening to this because we just gave <laughs> you like the three best landing spots that you could possibly go to with Kansas City. Los Angeles and Green Bay. And he could even still go to Buffalo too. So uh, let's get into the next guy, Chris Olave, wide receiver from Ohio State, currently going off the board about the 18th, 19th pick in the NFL draft, according to Grinding the Mocks. And Chris Olave, I personally don't have him higher than Traylon Burks, where he's currently going in, in mock drafts. I don't have him higher than Jahan Dotson, uh, who he's currently going higher than in mock drafts. I think Chris Olave is a, a fine, you know, number two complimentary wide receiver, but I don't see the, you know, the yards after catch ability. I don't see the complete, like the speed shows up in deep routes, but you don't see it after the catch as much. But where I have him actually going is to his team that I think me and Trevor both have mutual hatred towards in the New Orleans Saints with one of their first uh, two picks that they acquired recently from the Philadelphia Eagles. So whether it's pick 16, pick 19, I think Chris Olave is coming off the board fast. And I'd actually be willing to venture a guess that Chris Olave is long gone by the top 20 of the NFL draft because I think the NFL is very, very high on Chris Olave. Uh, New Orleans needs another wide receiver opposite Michael Thomas. They've needed one for years at this point, And a guy that can stretch the field in Chris Olave makes a ton of sense to me. I'm with you 100%. I think the Saints are, are, are my landing spot for Chris Olave. When you look at Jameis Winston and the type of quarterback that he is, you know, obviously in Tampa, he had a lot of the turnovers, but Jameis also led the league in passing one year. Like, this is a guy who loves to throw it deep, especially when – you know, Dirk Cutter and Todd Munkin and Bruce Arians were his coaches. I mean, they were those were vertical offenses, and he thrived. That got the most out of his ability. Now, last year when he played with the Saints, yeah, he was throwing less turnovers, but he was a little bit more gun-shy than what you would have wanted. They're certainly hoping that this coming year and the next year is going to be the best of, right? How he had his lump, he took his lumps in Tampa, he threw too many turnovers, okay? Now he was a little too gun-shy last year in New Orleans. They're hoping that it's that perfect marriage now of learning and experience to get that quarterback. But in order to get the most out of Jameis Winston, there's no doubt about it that you've got to be let he, he's got to be able to let it rip sometimes. And right now the New Orleans Saints don't have a let it rip wide receiver on the team. They have Michael Thomas, who they know can be a target machine for them in a lot of different ways, but they don't have that guy that Chris Olave could be, who, you know, as you mentioned, has that smooth, deep speed to him, who could be a really great threat for them in that regard. I think some people would say, like, oh, look what happened with uh, Deshaun Jackson when he was paired with Jameis, Jameis Winston as somebody who covered the Bucks while they had Deshaun Jackson I think the lack of being able to connect deep on with with with, with Djax had some more underlying things to it like I, I I think that Djax didn't exactly practice at full speed all the time and I think that when you have a player who can run four twos, four threes, and you're not consistently throwing him at his fastest in practice, and of course you're not going to have the timing right during the game. So I think that if you get a guy like Olave and he gets a little bit more of a rapport with Jameis Winston, I really do think that it could be a lot of really great production with him there in New Orleans. I had to go a little hometown. I had to go a little biased here. I wanted to talk my uh, talk about my team. I mean, it's the team right above my shoulder, man. The Dallas Cowboys. We got Chris Olave here projected at that 24th pick. Listen, obviously, in my opinion, as a Cowboys fan, that pick's probably going to come down to either interior offensive line or wide receiver, depending what the board is shaping out at. And if Olave's there, and let's just say Zion and Kenyon Green don't make it to you at 24, I'm more than fine with this fit. I mean, this is your quasi Amari Cooper type of replacement, you know, smooth in and out of his breaks, elite separator, great route runner, can stretch the field. He is that perfect complement to what you already have there, obviously with Michael Gallup when he's healthy, occupying that X, and C.D. Lamb kind of being, you know, your yards after catch, contested catch type of savant. If we're talking about just making this wide receiver core, obviously we know that Michael Gallup, when he's on the field, is going to spend the majority of his time on the boundary. And you can kind of use Chris Olave and CD Lamb interchangeably. You can use one in the slot. You can use one at the Z and not really worry about a team 
schematic type of fit in that regard. And in terms of fantasy, I mean, if he ends up in what we project, I mean, you guys are Bucks fans, but we can easily say if the Cowboys are humming and hoeing, they're going to be at least flirting with top five in offense. If we're getting right. that type of value insulation, that type of offensive insulation for a guy like Alave, especially, I mean, when you're combining with the fact that Dak Prescott's throwing on the rock, I mean, 24th pick makes a ton of sense. If that was the name that was called on draft day, uh, I mean, we're going to be streaming by then. I'd be more than fine and pretty ecstatic if that was the fit. Yeah, that makes sense. I think Chris Olave, it would be a good like pseudo Amari Cooper replacement if they were looking to replace that role in the yeah. offense. A guy that I think actually would be the Cowboys pick. I didn't actually have him going here, but he I think Traylon Burks, uh, Jerry Jones being an Arkansas dude would probably love Traylon Burks on his team. I actually have Traylon Burks going to a fit that I think it was either Daniel Jeremiah or McShay had in one of their earlier mocks. I have him going to Arizona. I pick 23 and his ADP right now, according to grinding the mocks is exactly pick 23. And I think the Arizona Cardinals, I didn't really trust them to be able to use Rondell Moore correctly, which makes me a little bit nervous for uh, Traylon Burks. Cause he was a guy that operated mostly out of the slot at Arkansas used a lot on, you know, bubble screens and stuff like that. But Traylon Burks gives them something that their offense doesn't really have outside of Deandre Hopkins, which is size and like physicality because Kyler, a smaller quarterback, Rondell Moore, smaller wide receiver. They had Chase Edmonds for a while, who was like a smaller um, running back, but James Conner gave them that size element this year. I think Traylon Burks would be a ton of fun opposite DeAndre Hopkins. You're not seeing number one corners um, because you have Hopkins on that outside. Hopkins is getting, you know, slightly up there in age too. So from a long-term perspective, I think having Traylon Burks tied to Kyler Murray in Arizona, assuming he stays there long-term, uh, I, I think it'd be a ton of fun. Uh, Traylon, I... <laughs> Obviously, extremely talented, and Arizona just needs talented wide receivers. But the big point for me, because Ari the Arizona Cardinals are obviously on this list of teams that we're picking from that need a wide receiver. And do I have them for anybody? Uh, I didn't have them for anybody in any of the top 50 wide receivers we have because, again, they have Rondell Moore and like they can't even use Rondell Moore. So, like, I, I don't, I just like, I don't have faith in them. I just don't have faith. In theory, you are right. This should totally work. But, uh, my spot for Traylon Burks is actually the New England Patriots. Um, and I know that Josh McDaniels is not there anymore, but remember, this is the team that utilized Cordero Patterson for the first time in a variety of different ways. They used him out of the backfield. They turned him into a running back. He was a special teams monster for him. That's the kind of creativity that you need for an offensive weapon like Traylon Burks. And I think that that's a really good spot that it will allow him to be him, if you will. And I think that Mac Jones is a really nice, accurate quarterback who knows how to throw things on time. He can really get Traylon Burks in rhythm because he's a lot a lot of what he does and the danger that he has as an offensive weapon comes in after the catch, you know, getting the ball in his hands very quickly, whether it's out of the backfield or whether it's a, a quick slant or a mesh route, a dig over the middle, something where he can get a full head of steam and then the rest of the guys just can't catch him. So I, I think that the Patriots, I would trust them to be able to get creative with how they use them. And that wide receiver room is not super impressive to me. So I think that there's a lot of targets to be had. Uh, I went the fun one. I went the one that, you already talked about Trevor uh, with uh, Jamison Williams. I actually went with the Green Bay Packers here. I mean, 22nd overall. That's kind of why I didn't have him going to Dallas because, I mean, I think he's going to be off the board by the time we pick, unfortunately. Obviously, the Arkansas bias is there. But if we're talking about it, obviously no rookie receiver is going, even a first-round receiver is going to step in and take on that 170, 180 target type of workload that Devontae Adams is just going to command no matter where he is. However, if you're picking in the first round, Taking a wide receiver that can at least supplement some of the traits, some of the value that Devontae Adams leaves behind is what I'm looking for here. And when we're talking about that, Devontae Adams was the fourth most targeted wide receiver in the NFL off of screens last year. And guess what? Traylon Brooks' best trait is his yards after catch ability. Again, you can't replicate what Devontae Adams' impact is on a defense, on a scheme. But if you're getting a guy that in this type of, you know, short area, get him the ball in his hands quick, let him move, Shanahanian type of scheme that LaFleur is kind of driven from, I think it would be a match made in heaven here. Just get him the ball in space, let him work. Talking about a 6'3", 230-pound athlete that can crack four fives and has cracked 22 miles per hour in game. I mean, I trust LaFleur to be able to get the most out of Traylon Burks' skill set. I trust Aaron Rodgers to feed the guy the ball because as we've seen multiple times over and over, if Aaron Rodgers has a talented enough wide receiver to respect and earn the targets, he has no problem with giving them 150, 160, 170 targets. Yeah, I, I think Aaron Rodgers <laughs> is one of the most like fantasy-friendly quarterbacks yeah. to have because he's so good and because he feeds his number one dude all the time. So I'd hate it as a Cowboys Burks. fan, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know uh, Traylon Burke's a guy that is 
just heavily on the minds of dynasty players. He's the guy that most people would say is the best receiver in the class. I you know, tend to think it's Drake London, but moving on to the final guy with a first round ADP currently uh, per grinding the mocks, we have Jahan Dotson. I pick 29, a guy that I am, you know, I would say significantly higher on relative to the dynasty community. This is where I actually have uh, as the Green Bay Packers landing spot. I have Jahan Dotson going there either, you know, 22, 28, whatever pick that they wanted to use on him. The reason I think it's a good, you know, fit for Jahan Dotson is because I think when you look at Aaron Rodgers, the receivers that he tends to like are the ones that do like the fundamental jobs of a wide receiver the best, get open and catch the ball and be reliable. And I think Garrett Wilson's probably the best in this class at that, but he's going to be off the board by that point in time. And I think Jahan Dotson is one of the best separators in this class, probably has the best hands in this class if I had to, you know, say so myself. So I think Jahan Dotson going to a system where he can get open quickly, get the ball out of Aaron Rodgers' hands like we've seen from Mike uh, from Matt LaFleur throughout his time in Green Bay. I like Jahan Dotson to Green Bay. What do you what do you think about that fit, Trevor? I like I, I like the fit again. Like in, in theory, Green Bay, he just he he's not really like Green Bay's type. Like they often just go for like bigger sized wide receivers, but I do, but I like the fit. Like, I think that if you plop Jahan Dotson in green Bay, he thrives, no doubt about it. I just don't know how realistic that might be as an actual pick, but in terms of the fit, what it could be, love it. The spot that I have him going to I think a team that really needs him, a team that quietly has a very big wide receiver need is the Indianapolis Colts. I think that he would be great for the Colts, man. They're sitting there with Michael Pittman jr. And, Paris Campbell, who can't even stay healthy. And uh, I'm looking at their depth chart now. Don't they don't even have Zach, Zach Pascal anymore. Don't have Zach <laughs> Pascal anymore. Ashton Doolin, Desmond Patton, Kiki Kuti. Like, the, I, the, those are the wide receivers after those guys. They're starting yeah. tight end. At Mo Ali Cox. Like, there are targets to be had in this offense. And with Matt Ryan coming in, especially, I think everybody talks about how, oh, yeah, great fit. Gets to work with Frank Bright. Quarterback crew, fantastic. I agree with all those points. <laughs> He got anybody to throw the ball to. And unfortunately, he's used to that from Atlanta. But like, come on, let's get this dude another offensive weapon. I'd love to see Jahan Dotson because I think he is a inside out kind of a wide receiver. He plays better on the outside than you would think for a player of his size. Uh, I agree with you. He's got some of the best hands in the class. And you got Michael Pittman on one side. You got Jahan Dotson on the other. And look, if you get Jahan Dotson in the building, that means that anything you get from Paris Campbell is just an added bonus. And then you really start to get a speed element into that wide receiver room, you hope. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I like him for the Colts. Don't think he lasts until the Colts first pick in the second round. But in terms of fits, I think Jahan Dotson would thrive in Indianapolis. They've shown the ability that they'll they'll go up and get their dudes. They did it with Taylor. They they've done it in the past as well. They they move around the board as much as any team in the league too. So I think that's a great fit. He also kind of fills the pseudo Ty Hilton replacement too because he kind of has a similar skill set to Ty as well. So uh, Danny, where you got Jahan Dotson going? <laughs> I mean, uh, this is going to be your Emmanuel Sanders replacement in Buffalo. I mean, it's just it, it, the writing's on the wall for me right here. I mean, this is a, obviously as you guys kind of mentioned, this is a quick, smooth route runner with arguably the best hands in the entire class. I just think he would be that perfect chain mover for this offense to really complement, you know, the dynamic ability of, you know, Gabriel Davis and Stefan Diggs on the outside. Obviously, Cole Beasley's already out of town. Emmanuel Sanders, and, you know, he likes to hop on NFL Network and talk about potential Gabe Davis breakouts. Well, I'm sorry. I mean, Jahan Dotson, to me, is more suited to be that number two wide receiver, letting Gabe Davis kind of fill into that wide receiver role that he's kind of grown accustomed to these last couple of years. Get Jahan Dotson in town. This offense is probably the best in the league. Yeah, that's that's a, that's a good fit as well. I think they're tough because I don't know if they're going to go wide receiver in the first round, but the, like kind of to Trevor's point, they don't have a whole lot of needs. Like there's not yeah. a lot of things that Buffalo needs help with. They could just go trenches and, you know, do the smart, uh, successful organization thing to do, but they could go for another toy for Josh Allen as well. Um, <laughs> so we're getting off of the guys that are like locked and loaded first round caliber talents. Most of these guys are probably going to be gone in the first round of the NFL draft. We're going to get through as many like second round caliber, third round caliber wide receivers as we can. We'll probably get through these main three and then maybe just pick a favorite for the last one. So we're not uh, keeping Trevor too long. But the first guy we're going to talk about is a guy that does have a chance to go in the first round. And he's received legitimate first round hype already in Christian Watson, the wide receiver, you know, phenomenal athlete from NDSU, blew up the combine, blew up the senior bowl. Everything about the like pre-draft process has gone Christian Watson's way. I actually have him sliding a little bit past where you see him normally go. And I have him going to the Chicago Bears at 48. Another team that I think to Trevor's point is like high key and desperate need of wide receiver help. They have Darnell Mooney and 
I mean, now that Robinson's gone, they don't really have anybody else that's worth a damn. So I think they're going to use pick 48 on a wide receiver. And I think if Christian Watson was available at that pick or if they had to maneuver up a little bit, I think he'd be a good fit because they, what they need is some size in that core to, uh, to help out Justin Fields because they really haven't done anything to help Justin Fields this offseason. I'll just say one thing. Isn't Byron Pringle currently their wide receiver too? Or yeah, they, just, they grabbed like... Byron Pringle and Equinemius <laughs> like, St. Brown yeah, to try no. and actually like pseudo fill out their wide receiver core. I, I think they need another dude there. Not uh, So Christian Watson, um, I have the Kansas City Chiefs here and I think... I like this in theory because you get to play with Patrick Mahomes and it's a cheat code, but Christian Watson is not as he doesn't have the ball skills that everybody assumes that he does. Oh, he's, okay. he's big. He's tall. He's fast. He's smooth. He's an Uber athlete compared to the competition that he plays at the SCS level. But like there, there, there are multiple clips of him getting open, separating well, Nine balls coming his way, and he just doesn't track it. He just can't find it. Or, or you know, like there's their uh, – I can't remember what team they're playing. It wasn't Albany. I don't remember what it was. But like It was Albany. I know exactly what player the deep, The deep post. The deep, <laughs> post, the just, deep post. I literally just watched his – That, just, that, just, go, so that just goes through his hands. It just yeah. goes through his hands. And it's I, – I, so he, he is an incredible athlete, but he has a ways to go, man. I think there are a lot of people that are saying like, oh, yeah, this is the first-round wide receiver. I wrote an article after the combine, and I, say, I said he's a top 50 lock because I, I that's what I think. I think he's a top 50 lock. I think he's going to go in the top 50. But for people to think that he'd be a day one wide receiver to step in right away, I mean, I, he's his tape does not show that. I think it's going to be a work in progress. But who better to work with than Patrick Mahomes, right, is a guy who is going to give you plenty of opportunities to get better at those deep passes. And they need a speed element anyway. So why not take a chance on a guy like that? I you're mean, hoping they, for Chase Claypool, right? Like that's what you're hoping. Yes, to totally. That, that yeah. athlete that didn't have the production that didn't, and like his production's okay relative to the the team because they threw like 2,300 passing yards last year. So 800 yards doesn't look that bad when you look at what the team actually <laughs> produced. But it's uh it's tough for Christian Watson. I'm on the same track as you. I think this is more of like a project day two wide receiver rather than a guy I'm actually willing to take in the first round. But I do think he's he's going to be gone by the top 50 at minimum. Yeah, I mean, uh, the spot I have him here, uh, whether you want to project it at 32 or 34, I actually have him going to the Detroit Lions here. I mean, it's simple. Side speed profile that really outside of DJ Chark that Detroit doesn't really have. Obviously, your main offensive influencers on that team are going to be TJ Hawkinson, Amon or St. Brown, and DeAndre Swift. None of them really having that straight third-level type of verticality that you would expect Watson to bring when he's developed again, you mentioned he has some issues that he's got to work on his ball tracking his overall just hands in general. He's one of the highest draw percentages in this entire class. Right. Uh, and it's funny because the guy that you're expecting him to be the long-term replacement for in Detroit, obviously one year, $10 million deal. I mean, DJ charts kind of like a good guide to what you could expect from sky or uh, not sky more next one we're going to be talking about christian watson right away where he's going to occupy that third level threat he's going to stretch the defense but realistically here again i'm not really too high on him as well trevor's not too high on him Corey, you just said you were watching his tape what were your thoughts on him yeah i i have him like back in the so the guy we're going to talk about next george pickens is like my wide receiver eight right now i think they have a similar skill set they're both like field stretchers they seem to need some kind of development but at least with george pickens we've seen you know elite level play at a big school so it's 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 pretty tough to compare those two um, like we could transition that right into George Pickens, who's the next guy in terms of uh, ADP, in terms of grinding the mocks. He's currently going off the board 38.6. So just top of the second round for the most part. Um, we talked about the Indianapolis Colts already. I think he would be a good fit in Indianapolis. He's a guy that could, like Michael Pittman Jr. is your possession X receiver, the guy that led your team in target share, led your team in targets. I don't think George Pickens is, because he gets labeled as a guy that could have been the wide receiver one this year. At, if he didn't tear his ACL in spring practice and had played the whole season in 2020 and in 2019, we never saw him command an elite target share. So I do think George Pickens is more well suited to be a number two in an offense and be the field stretcher in an offense. We're kind of talking about the same archetypes in a row here with, with Watson and, <laughs> and George Pickens, in my opinion. So that's where I think he fits. Well, I think with Matt Ryan, you, like you said, you need some pieces in that offense. And I think George Pickens would also kind of fit well on the opposite side of Michael Pittman. This is my favorite fit. Okay, you ready for it? Jacksonville Jaguars. Let's go. Give Trevor Lawrence George Pickens, baby. This guy's got a wide receiver one ceiling. I've been saying it for a long time now. Throughout the beginning of the, the I'll say like draft season, like January, February, 
I had George Pickens as my wide receiver too. I had him as wide receiver one going into the season, even with the torn ACL. Drake London comes up, has an unreal year, shows that he's an absolute alpha. So I had him at wide receiver one, but I had George Pickens at wide receiver two. I was like, okay, he came back. He played in the most important games of the season. Just wait till you see how he tests. I guarantee he's going to test better than you think. He did. Now I've gone back and I've watched the film with some other guys. And so I've got Chris Olave and Jameson Williams ahead of him in my rankings as of right now. I'm not sure if I'm going to tinker with that, but as of right now, George Pickens is my wide receiver four. But I do believe that he has wide receiver one on a team potential and Jacksonville I don't give a damn how much money or fake money they paid Christian Kirk uh Marvin Jones still there okay cool Zay Jones doesn't do anything for me George Pickens can come in right away and I genuinely think that he could step in and be that target share guy if not the top on the team somewhere close to where in year two year three they're really leaning on him Trevor Lawrence needs that kind of a player then he needs a wide receiver that is like George Pickens and I think that this would be a great spot if the Jaguars could get George Pickens at the top of the second round I think Marvin Jones is a good outlook for him. If he can turn into Marvin Jones, like prime Marvin Jones that we saw with Cincinnati and Detroit, I think that's the type of mold that you're talking about, kind of a long lean receiver that eventually became, you know, a number one or a one B in an offense with Marvin Jones. But uh, Danny, I'll let you go with where you got George Pickens. I I, I do like the fit. It sounds like you're, you know, quite a bit higher on George Pickens than I am. I I mean, this one's simple to me. Uh, Yeah, you paid Curtis Samuel a lot of money last offseason. Yeah, you drafted Deami Brown. Obviously, he didn't produce much as a rookie. But I really like Pickens to the Commanders at 47th overall. Obviously, we've kind of seen the success uh, with Carson Wentz working with that type of archetype of receiver in the past. I just think that you need another wide receiver to be in those two wide receiver sets with Terry McLaurin. And I do think Pickens, when he's fully healthy, when he's fully acclimated to an NFL offense, can be that ancillary secondary target that Carson Wentz is going to need if they want that offensive or uh, that Washington Commander offense to actually, you know, take effect this year. So 47th overall, Washington Commanders, George Pickens kind of makes a lot of sense in my head. Also love that fit. Also really love that fit. Would love Terry McLaurin and George Pickens on the same team. Now, if they could just get a quarterback. Yeah, 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 they're going to need one of those guys. Um, So let's get to the final guy that I would say is like locked and loaded top 50 day two capital at minimum round two capital in a guy that Danny loves. I love, I just finished watching him. I'm not sure what your thoughts are on him, Trevor, but let's talk about Sky Moore, uh, wide receiver from Western Michigan. (laughs) 43.5 is his current uh, ADP according to grinding the mocks. I, the first thing that I said when I watched this dude, and I know this is like a really cliche thing to say about a player. I saw a New England Patriot, man. I think he would be a perfect fit in New England. I know he's like a pseudo slot receiver and most people are going to see him that way because he doesn't have, you know, necessarily the route tree that would dictate he could play on the outside. And we don't know level of competition wise if he can win against like SEC corners because we didn't see that from him in college playing at Western Michigan. But I think, again, going back to what I said about Jahan Dotson, a guy that can get open consistently, make things happen after the catch and has really, really good hands. I think it's something that the New England Patriots would really, really value in their wide receiver core. Now, would they want to stack up, you know, Kendrick Bourne and Jacoby Myers and Sky Moore, who all could pseudo play the same role? Maybe not, but I, I really like the fit of Sky Moore to the Patriots if they think he can be, eventually become, you know, a flanker or an outside wide receiver. Yeah, I don't mind. I don't mind that fit at all. I mean, I think of when Brandon Cooks was there with the Patriots, you know, I think that that's a that's a player that's probably of a similar mold that could have a similar impact. And obviously, Brandon Cooks has a hell of a career no matter where he's been. But I see Sky Moore in a similar light. I got the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, this is a team that needs wide receiver help. Doesn't matter how many wide receivers they've drafted in the top 50 or top 100 over the last couple of years. The only one worth a damn is Devontae Smith. That's it. I mean, I'm out on Jalen Rager. I'm out on J.J. Ortega Whiteside as much as it pains me because he's my wide receiver too that year. Stack and L's. Uh, Quez Watkins, I mean, they, they like, but Quez Watkins to me is like a wide receiver four kind of a player. So I would love Sky more with the Philadelphia Eagles. I think they got to remain fast. I think that's got to be part of their 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 MO as long as Jalen Hurts is their quarterback. They've got to keep that speed on the field. And I think they're going to feed Devontae Smith a lot more than they did this year. And I think that's something they probably, if they did self-scouting over the summer uh, or over the offseason, which I know they did, that's probably an area where they're like, yeah, we got to get this guy ball the ball a lot more. But he can't do it alone. So I would love to get a player of Sky Moore's skill set. Boy, is he quick off the line of scrimmage, man. Just understands footwork so well, knows how to set guys up. He can lie with his upper body, man. And I think that's what I see from his film is that, you know, he'll 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 fully turn his shoulder and his chest one way, but his hips, because you can't lie with your hips, of course, you go the other. And it's just, it, it, you watch corners be like, oh, shoot, I thought he was going that way. And it's like, he's just a master of setting guys up and, I really like him for that tape. He's reliable, I think, in the catch percentages categories. And so I think he's going to be a damn good receiver in the NFL. 
I just want to say I'm glad you addressed that, man. His footwork off the line of scrimmage is nasty. just poetry. It's, nasty. it's just poetry. And again, I hate throwing around this comp because I feel like everybody on Twitter, everybody on their on their podcast talks about this comp. But I mean, this is like golden tate 2.0 when i watch him i mean it's just it's just simple to me get the ball in his hands let him work after the catch and sky Moore, guess what if this ends up on draft day there's a hard time that i'm gonna have letting this guy go past the middle of the first round of our rookie drafts sky Moore to the kansas city chiefs 29th 30th overall pick whatever you want to do but basically here the role that you would be drafting him to play is yes we know tyree kill in the past was that deep level, third level type of threat. But we did see a change in his role this past year, having that lower A dot, relying more on a, a yards after catch type of game this past year. And if you're bringing in Sky Moore, obviously the in, the insulation here is going to be in that Chiefs offense already. But in terms of straight volume, in terms of straight role, you got MBS as your field stretcher. You got Juju as your possession guy. Get a yards after catch, juice, monster, whatever the heck you want to call him. Sky Moore, put him with Patrick Mahomes, put him in this Chiefs offense. And the first round draft capital, uh, there's no chance I'm leaving my drafts without him. Yeah, I he's I don't know. Do you, Trevor, you're more connected to the NFL draft community. Do you think he's going to go in the first round, or do you think he's more so a, a guy that? Because I, I heard Todd McShay talk about it on the first draft podcast. He's like his name's coming off very quickly Friday, you know, Friday night. Like he, he'll be one of the first names in the first and the second round. Is what I saying. think. I think every team in the league really wants to get him at the top of the second round. Like, I agree. I think that he's going to be a player that's going to come off the board very quickly in the second round. Now, is that desire going to bleed over into night one a little bit? And somebody who's maybe picking on early day two goes, mm, Cincinnati, what do you want for 31? We want Scott. Or Detroit at 32. Like, what do you want for those picks? Let's go. just go up and get our guy so we don't have to sweat for another 24 hours before – we can maybe pull the trigger and get him. So I, I I would tell you what I have heard and the feeling that I get is that there's just a lot of teams that want to pick him in the second round. So that's kind of where I think uh, where I think we are with Sky Moore. I'll say one thing. So uh, I can pretty much dash my any type of hopes of getting him at 56, I'm assuming. <laughs> I would be extremely shocked if he left. Kansas City would have to pass on him three times. For that yeah, game. it's not happening. But I mean, I, one can dream as a Cowboys fan. <laughs> yeah. All right. So because we're running a little low on time here, um, each of us, we're just going to go around and say two more guys that are probably more round three, round four guys that we love the fit of. And I'll start with a guy that I think is going criminally low in mock drafts right now. 84.6 is his average draft position, uh, according to grinding the mocks. David Bell, wide receiver from Purdue. I think it's absolutely criminal he's going that low. All he's done, I know he didn't test well. Like I never saw a good athlete on tape anyway, so I'm not concerned about his testing. What he does do is get open and catch the ball and play football and win after the catch and everything that you want to see him do from a wide receiver. I think he'd be a perfect fit in Cleveland to replace Jarvis Landry because my comp for him was Jarvis Landry. And unfortunately for him, he tested like Jarvis Landry, but I think he has a similar... <laughs> Uh, skill set. So I like David Bell to Cleveland. And then my other one is you brought up Jacksonville needing another wide receiver. How about we go to a familiar territory for Jacksonville, a wide receiver, and we go get Trevor Lawrence, his old buddy from Clemson in round three or four in Justin Ross. I don't know when Justin Ross is going to go. I'm sure it's because like medicals, if he falls, because, you know, he obviously had like the neck issue, but I, I still think a team is going to talk themselves into the freshman Justin Ross still being there at some point. And I think Jacksonville makes a ton of sense at the top of the third round or the, the end of the third round. I did not realize how terrible Jarvis Landry tested. It was yeah. bad. This it is unbelievable bad. because, okay, you <laughs> said, you said that name, obviously you bring up David Bell and I'm like, he's just not an athlete, man. I mean, he's just like, like criminally not an athlete. And then you brought up Jarvis Landry and I'm like, okay, there's, there's no way Jarvis Landry tested that bad. And he <laughs> tested as bad, if not worse than David yeah. Bell. If not worse in some categories, that's insane. Um, okay, so some fits that I like a lot. Yep. Uh, I'm going to give you three. I'm going to cheat. Um, Calvin Austin going to the Buffalo Bills to replace their slot with uh, with Cole Beasley gone. So you move, you lose the possession in Cole Beasley. Stephon Diggs signs the extension. You still got Gabe Davis, the vertical field stretcher. Let's get Calvin Austin in there. Let's get his shiftiness. Let's get his speed underneath dude. Give him a couple of mesh routes. Dump the ball off to him. Make magic happen. So I think that, that would be an interesting one. The other one that I like, Alec Pierce going to the Los Angeles Chargers because I didn't use the Chargers yet. I think that one, again, he is a 
really good athlete that doesn't always show up on tape at times, but pairing him with a quarterback like Justin Herbert, I think could get a lot out of him. He'd play similarly to what we've seen from Mike Williams. So I don't know if that's too redundant. Maybe I'm just thinking about the, the, the role already succeeding within that offense, but I do like the fit. I like that as a landing spot as a potential guy to come in and fill that role. If I don't know, Williams misses time or if he's on the bench, cause he's taking a break, a break for a series or whatever. I kind of like him in that role. And then the other one that I like, like John Mechie the third to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I don't know when Tampa is going to draft a wide receiver. I think they're going to at some point in this draft, but clearly with Godwin back, with Evans back, I think they're going to get Gronk back. They've got Scotty Miller. They've got Tyler Johnson. Uh, they have Russell Gage as well, right? They've got so many different options at wide receiver. They can afford to wait. But John Mechie is the type of wide receiver that they like, meaning – this dude blocks his ass off. So he is, I think, I think a good wide receiver. He's not a crazy athlete. I thought when I, when I was kind of predicting a really big jump in production from him, I was on the impression that he was a little bit better of an athlete than he actually is. You go back, you watch tape and go, okay, it's not like he's the slowest dude in the world, but he's not, a, he's not an elite athlete, but what he does is his game is so well-rounded and Tampa's offense specifically loves to get their wide receivers involved with blocking. I think, he would be a great fit in what Tampa likes to do. Speaking quickly to the redundance thing, do you think he's redundant with Godwin's role though? Because I think most you know teams would project Mechie to be a slot receiver in the NFL. Do you think that, and, and Tyler Johnson, honestly, a little bit similar. I'm not sure how high they are on Tyler Johnson still, but I do think, you know, as a Bucks fan and, you know, Brampton, Ontario's finest, John Mechie, he is a Canadian lad, of course. So we stand, we stand our Canadians over here. Do you think he'd be redundant in that offense uh, with, with Godwin's role there? Early on, probably, because it's not like they're taking away targets for Godwin for John Mechie. But I think that Mechie immediately becomes wide receiver four at worst on that team. You know, like it, it's almost like you have, you have different buckets for the team. Like Mike Evans is his own unique bucket. So he's just going to be in one category on his own. You've got Chris Godwin and then you've probably got John Mechie on the depth chart right under him for that kind of role. And then you've got Russell Gage. And I would say probably like Scotty Miller as more of these like speed guys that I think if you want to get more speed into your game plan, whether it's deep threat stuff or stuff over the middle or deep crossers or whatever it may be, those guys might be able to fill that role for you. But I think that there would be plenty of packages where you go, okay, we're going to have three wide receivers on the field, but it's also a play that could involve something that's quick hitting. That's going to involve a lot of blocking. And for that, you would want to get three really great blockers on the field at wide receiver. So the redundancy with Godwin, yes, a little bit, especially maybe in year one, maybe year two. But that you, you, no coach is ever going to tell you, nah, we don't need another wide receiver who blocks his ass off. Like you're right. always going to want more of those guys. Yeah, and uh, I, I know everybody who was watching at home kind of saw my eyes light up when you mentioned Menchie. Just uh, anytime I get the chance, just want to mention uh, played with this guy back in the day, Team Ontario played against him when he was on Brampton. I was on Hamilton. Had to little shout that out. 2000 born, you know, uh, either way, I'll go through my two fits. And uh, one of them, I actually picked your guys, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. You guys can let me know your thoughts on this. I kind of talked to Bush about it uh, off camera before we started. But I mean, we know when the Bucs are at humming and home, when the Bucs are really stretching a defense out, they are one of the most fearless offenses in the entire league. I mean, we're talking about Tom Brady last year, most deep throws attempted in the 2022 season, top five in big time throw percentage. Shout out PFF. Obviously, you work there. Uh, <laughs> I have Jalen Tolbert going here. I mean, you know, a more big body type of field stretching type of wide receiver that you can kind of put next to Mike Evans. Obviously, he's not going to fill the Godwin role when he misses early season, but he just kind of gives you another big body that you could put on the outside. Obviously, with Tyler Johnson, you have slot versatility there. Scotty Miller, you got, you know, speed element there. At least with Jalen Tolbert, you're getting a, a different archetype to some of the guys you already have. That's why I like the fit. The other one I want to mention, I mean, I had to mention John Mechie fitting somewhere, and I mean, it's a no-brainer for me putting him back with his uh, college quarterback with Mac Jones in the New England Patriots. Whether mm. you want to say 54th overall or 85th overall, don't know the exact draft capital you should expect here, but I mean, it's pretty simple to me. He's a day one slot Z type of wide receiver, and his main concerns obviously are his injury status and potentially cap ceiling that you mentioned with that limited athleticism, but Getting him there, being a reliable chain producer for or chain mover for Mac Jones would ultimately be good. I mean, at the end of the day here, if you're the New England Patriots, getting that type of player with a physical edge that we've seen the Patriots really love and covet in the past, 
John Mechie brings in spades. I mean, I've talked about this guy's blocking since his second year on campus before mm-hmm. he even broke out. I mean, this guy just is fearless. He'll see a quarter. <laughs> there was a, or a Devontae Smith screen pass I remember watching last year on tape where John Mechie literally drove the corner 20 yards right out of his own end zone. I'm just watching. I'm like, that just screams New England Patriot to me. Just that physical edge, that physical blocker, that guy that is willing to put the team above himself, above his own stats. And I think Mechie would fit that to a T. There's a reason why that guy got playing time before yeah. he was draft eligible. And that's why, because he does quote unquote, the little things. Well, yeah. Saban has the, the Patriots <laughs> blood too. So he, uh, he obviously would love that. So quick two questions that I have for you, Trevor, before we get out of here. Well, mm-hmm. uh, this was fun. Of course. Thank you for joining us. I want, we're, we're obsessed with draft capital in the dynasty fantasy football community. I don't know if you know this, but we love when our wide receivers get drafted that we love, like our sleepers get drafted in the third round. We're like, yes, give them third round draft capital. That's all we need to be all in on this guy. Who is one like perceived day three wide receiver that you think is going to sneak into day two? Uh, Like maybe it could be your favorite sleeper or just a guy that you've heard a lot about uh, going potentially higher than people think. Okay. vice versa. Okay. So you want a day three wide receiver who might go day two. That's what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like Vailis Jones Jr. from Tennessee is getting a lot of hype. <laughs> really? Isn't he like like a senior two years citizen older than I am right now? <laughs> he is, he is, but like I like people keep talking about him. Like people keep talking about him, like giving him all sorts of hype. So it would be kind of shocked for me if he got a day two selection, but his hype is kind of high. I mean, outside of the guys that we talked about, like, you know, another guy that we didn't mention is Wandale Robinson. And like Wandale Robinson, I think has a lot of athleticism that you love but he's got the shortest <laughs> arms that anybody's ever seen so i, I don't know if that's gonna keep him from going at, at, in this in the, the back half of day two he might be an early day three guy but he's kind of a fringe player right there alec pierce i think is firmly a day two guy see that's a shock to people that i think that was like that was the more the type of guy i was talking about calvin austin and alec pierce you think they're comfortably day two wide receivers come the nfl draft i think so i think just too many teams love to invest in wide receiver and maybe look i I could be way off on how many exactly they're drafting but yeah i mean like calvin austin alec pierce khalil shakir uh like i think that those guys are I, i think those guys are pretty solid day two guys like it might be round three but i don't i don't think they're fringe guys maybe yeah Maybe J- I guess like Jalen Tolbert's probably another guy that I would think might be a fringe day two, day three guy. So I don't know. That That's a handful. Of, there's there's a handful of names. For sure. Yeah. So again, appreciate you coming on. If you guys enjoyed this video, as always, hit the like button. Comment any of your thoughts down below. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Go ahead and check out the other stock exchange that, we're, <laughs> that we've made reference to, the NFL stock exchange with Trevor and uh, Connor over there. And actually, quick date while we're on day three wide receivers, quick shout out to uh, Britton Covey from U- uh, the Utah oh, Utes. Oh, yeah. followed me on Twitter yesterday and asked me uh, oh, how yeah. he ranked uh, <laughs> according to PFF and avoided tackle percentage. <laughs> and I was laughing. I was speaking while we're on this topic of older wide receivers because he's like 25 years old. Um, big shout out to a, a Utah Ute there. I'm not, I wasn't catching a whole lot of Pac-12 <laughs> after dark. So I, I got to be honest. I didn't know who he was. Speaking of a New England Patriot. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Yeah, 100%. Not 100%. Adam Humphreys all over again. Him, right there. Kyle Phillips, you know, just like. Uh, just, what, who's the Alabama guy? Slay, uh, Slay, uh, Slay Bolden. Bolden. Slay, Slay Bolden. Bolden. Yeah, he's, he's the new Gunnar Olszewski uh, going forward. So. Um, again, appreciate Trevor for coming on. Go check out all of his work. It'll be linked in the description. Check out all of our stuff as well. Our dynasty rankings manifesto with our, you know, one quarterback, super flex, uh, you know, positional rankings, top 100s, bucketed rankings by age, all that stuff available on Patreon in the link in the description. And also me and Danny looking like the last pick in the drafts right now. <laughs> um, make sure to go check out underdogfantasy.com. Use promo code FSE at sign up and first deposit and you'll get 100% on your money. Uh, if you put in 50 bucks, you get 100 on the site to play with. And also you'll get our Dynasty Rankings Manifesto totally for free as a thank you for doing that. So peace out, guys. We'll talk to you soon.